My name is Ashley Koble, and I am a forest watershed scientist with Enkazi, uh, based in Corvallis, Oregon. My background is uh, really biogeochemistry of both uh, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Um, today I'm going to talk specifically about the issue of water quantity, um, in, and particularly uh, I'm interested in water quantity in stream flow. If we focus on the stream flow component, it's important to, to briefly review and update uh, you know, the basic forest water balance. So of course stream flow represented by Q in the uh, forest water balance equation is really the uh, function of changes in your inputs and outputs. Um, inputs of course include uh, precipitation as rain, snow, and um, also condensation such as fog. Um, but our outputs can uh, include transpiration from trees but also evaporation from the entire ecosystem. And so evaporation is from all surfaces in the ecosystem, so that includes uh, water stored that's intercepted by tree canopies that can evaporate to the atmosphere as well as uh, on the, the um, forest floor evapor evaporation from those surfaces as well. Um, and then the other component, which can be a, a, a plus or a minus depending on the system, is uh, subsurface storage. So. Storage components for water include water that's stored in uh, soils, so in upper layers of soils, but also in deeper groundwater um, locations. Um, so base flow is, uh, is a function of those storage components. And so look at a typical hydrograph, our base flow basically refers to flow that's supplied from groundwater sources to the stream in between storm events. Um, and so if you look at this hydrograph, you can see the spiky nature of storm events uh, in terms of when those precipitation events occur um, relative to how base flow is changing throughout the year. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, we need to talk about the Mediterranean climate uh, that's experienced here. So um, that means that there's high water availability during a uh, portion of the year, and then there's a dry season, uh, which you can see in late summer when you see the decline in the base flow condition. Uh, and it's important to talk about that because uh, in terms of tree water relations, the growing season is, is offset from that season of high water availability, and that has important implications for stream flow. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about climate uh, responses over time, which we already heard a great deal about, um, and, and how those climate-related shifts in timing, uh, not only quantity but also timing, may have important implications for water availability in stream flow uh, annually as well as seasonally. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of those projections for climate trends for each of these water budget components. Um, this is one example uh, of all of those components, but I'm going to talk about some more specific examples. Um, so starting with the component of storage. So in terms of how we expect some of these storage, um, the storage of shallow soil water availability to change with uh, some of these climate change scenarios. Kim Litke uh, and, and her co-authors from the University of Washington um, instrumented uh, upper soil layers across Oregon, Western Oregon and Washington in Douglas fir soils. Um, and then they used all of that information to, uh, to apply to these climate, uh, various climate scenarios. So they had a moderate scenario, a mild, a mild, a moderate, and an uh, in a severe climate change scenario. They found that overall there was an 8 to 19 percent decline in annual um, shallow soil available water supply. Um, as seasonally, in terms of summer, they found a, a decrease in 25 to 72 percent um, overall. And they, within the, the scope of their study, they found the greatest decreases occurred in uh, coastal regions of both Washington and Oregon. Um, another component of storage, of course, are deeper groundwater, um, groundwater sources. I would say there's a lot less known about, about this particular component of the water budget. Um, one study, this is a study from Mixner and others in 2016, they evaluated aquifers for the entire western U.S. Um, and so they identified that there are, there are knowledge gaps. Um, in, the, in this diagram, the upper panel is essentially uh, the cr uh, sort of what those groundwater recharge sources are for the current climate, and then they have another scenario about some of that uncertainty and what that might look like in a future climate. 
Um, so w what they found was that uh, overall there was little uh, change to even a positive increase in terms of northern aquifer water storage. Um, but they did see a decline in mountain system recharge um, due to decreased snowpack. But they note that that is dependent on elevation. So, um, so this is informative, but, uh, but this is uh, certainly an area where there are some major knowledge gaps in terms of what groundwater recharge looks like um, with climate change. Um, <clears throat> so moving into the precipitation component, as we heard earlier, one of the major changes in terms of precipitation is the change in snowpack. And that's really, um, that's really because models are better able to make projections for temperature changes and temperature change can shift the type of precipitation that's received. So in milder climates, um, there are expected to be uh, more of a decline in snowpack. Um, this paper is, uh, Moat and others updated their 2005 paper with a more recent analysis across the, all the snow tell sites in the Western United States. And they found that 90% um, of those sites had trends of declining trends of um, April 1st snow water equivalent. So the amount of snow uh, present on April 1st each year. Of those, 33% of those uh, were significant declines. And 2% uh, of sites showed significant increases. Um, on this figure, the red in indicates a declining trend and the blue indicates a positive trend in terms of the spatial variability of those responses. All of those declining trends um, were observed across all months, states, and climates. Um, and the declines were largest in spring in Pacific states and locations with, with mild winter climate. Um, Continuing with their results, this is also from their paper, in this case, uh, taking those observations and applying it to a model. On the panel on the left, you have those modeled observations uh, for April 1st snow water equivalent. On the right, um, what they've done is they've detrended um, the data set to remove the effect of temperature to evaluate the role of warming um, on that snowpack decline. And so you can see that on the figure on the right um, in Oregon and Washington, um, there's no longer uh, large swaths of red indicating um, significant declines as there were um, prior to the detrending of the temperature response. Um, so ultimately, uh, what, being interested in stream flow, um, stream flow has also been observed to decline in the Pacific Northwest over time. Um, declines have been observed by multiple studies. Um, Declines have shown declines in stream flow at annual basis um, in terms of mean summer flow and also peak stream flow. Um, in this study, this figure is showing you uh, results from Cormos and others in 2016, uh, where they're looking in the top four panels. Those are four different metrics of, of essentially low flow metrics. Um, so those are using um, mean August flow, mean September flow, mean summer flow, and also an index they're calling the 7Q10, which is minimum flow for one week at the probability of 0 0.1 uh, occurrence. Um, and you can see by the red circles that, that generally there's a decline in those various summer metrics um, across the Pacific Northwest. Um, the bottom two panels are just showing you similar metrics, but for winter, and so there you're not seeing those, those major declines as, as were observed uh, during the summer stream flow season. So in addition to having declines over time, um, an earlier analysis also demonstrated that there's earlier st stream flow timing. Um, and so as we previously discussed, there's earlier onset of, of springtime snowmelt, but also observations of earlier stream flow timing. Um, so those are sort of how climate is, is currently affecting many of those components of the water budget. And now I want to move into um, talking about what some of the hydrological responses are to some of these uh, natural disturbances um, that may be uh, related to some of the, the climate change factors. Um, so we've talked a little bit about fire today, and I think there'll be some more discussion about that later. Um, but understanding the fire response, um, how fire may affect the hydrologic cycle is important. Um, so in terms of snowpack, um, in this study in 2011, this is a study from Western uh, Canada, uh, where they found that in a burned site, that's the panel on the top left, um, there was more snow accumulation 
that occurred at the burn site relative to the control site, which is the site on the right. Um, and so they found that uh, peak snow water equivalent, uh, so the amount of snow was 40 to 45 percent greater uh, in the burn site than the unburned site. Um, so theoretically, that's great that there's more snow and potentially more water available. However, they also found that it melted faster. And so it actually melted 9 to 15 days earlier um, in the burn site than in the unburned site. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of observations following clear cut, which would follow a similar pattern. Um, that panel on the bottom is showing you the snow melt right. So um, the burn are the two, uh, there's two different years that are measured, but the, it's showing you that the burn, the snow melt rate is actually double um, that in the burn stand relative to the control stand. Um, so that's snow melt response to fire, but, but stream flow response to fire is also important to understand. This is a very recent uh, report uh, drafted by Sun uh, et al. in 2019. And if we focus specifically on the Pacific Northwest region, um, that's region 17. Uh, here in this figure, the uh, yellow uh, bar on the right is, is showing you the expected change in discharge attributed to fire. Um, and so the top panel is change in terms of quantity of millimeters, and then the bottom panel is change in terms of percentage. Um, so the yellow is showing an increase. Um, the lighter blue, which is the middle bar, is a uh, change in discharge uh, expected due to climate alone. And then the one on the left, the far left, darker blue, is change in discharge due to both processes. So, um, so fire plus climate uh, still indicates a positive change expected for, for Region 17 in their analysis. Um, so just to rehash those findings, there, there's anticipated increased stream flow with fire, uh, including increased peak flows, shortened times to peak flows, and increased susceptibility to flash floods um, following fire. Um, so I only have one example of this, but it's a very, it's a, it's a good example of um, understanding what some of the forest pathogens may do in terms of affecting uh, forest hydrology. Kevin Bladen uh, and his collaborators at Oregon State University recently published this in Science of the Total Environment. Um, so they looked at uh, Swiss needle cast, which um, is a foliar uh, disease uh, that affects Douglas fir. And um, it can lead to chronic foliar occlusion um, that affects canopy architecture and affects, of course, transpiration rates um, in those systems. And so you might hypothesize that, um, that trees affected with this would have lower transpiration rates, which would mean greater water availability, greater runoff for the ecosystem itself. Um, so that's one hypothesis. However, based on other literature, there's uh, from, I think, pine, beaten, pine beetle, um, they found that even though there was depressed transpiration rates, there was actually an increase in evaporation and transpiration of un understory vegetation and other surfaces that, that sort of counterbalanced that, so they didn't actually see an increase in runoff. Um, so in this particular study, what they did find, they used a gradient um, across Oregon uh, of a variety of sites, and they found that discharge did generally increase um, with increasing percentage of Swiss needle cast in the watershed. Um, and then they posed these two scenarios, um, top panel A and bottom panel B, in terms of what that expected hydrologic response might be, with the top panel showing you a monoculture Douglas fir uh, complete uh, with all of them affected by Swiss needle cast. And that, um, and, and that top panel primarily differs from the bottom panel in terms of that understory transpiration component and also the understory and litter evaporation component. So no change in panel A, which ultimately re results in increased surface runoff. In panel B, um, when they have additional species present, um, so while transpiration does decline, um, they, they also see an increase in understory transpiration, an increase in understory and litter evaporation, which ultimately can maybe reduce uh, the hill slope runoff. Um, but overall, based on their findings, they recommended managing for resilience by, by um, incorporating mixed species stands that may aid in buffering increases in stream flow in places where Swiss needle cast is, is a concern. Um, so now I'm going to move into what some of those hydrologic uh, responses are to forest management. <clears throat> so, um, 
So the, the hydrological response to forest management is, is well studied. There are hundreds of paired watershed studies that have evaluated uh, uh, the immediate response to overstory removal. Um, and so this figure on the, on the right is a figure based on the generalized response over broad spatial areas, which are generally that when you uh, remove large swaths of overstory vegetation, you have an increase in surface runoff. You have a decrease in, in um, in evapotranspiration and you have a decrease in canopy interception. Um, to demonstrate some of these uh, to demonstrate some of these things, um, this is a review, an updated review of, from Brown and others, which updates the original Bosch and Hewlett findings, which are that reducing canopy cover does increase annual stream flow. Um, and this is true for both hardwoods and conifers. And so that's the immediate response to forest harvest, but of course, um, it's important to consider what the hydrologic response is over the course of the entire rotation age. Um, so up to 40 years, 60 years, et cetera. Um, so this is a figure um, that, that evaluates the long-term response at an annual basis across many experimental um, forests in the United States. Many of these are, uh, are deciduous species. Um, so I wanted to point out that basically the expected response is that uh, immediately there's an increase in flow. Um, and then as green up occurs, then you start to see this hydrologic recovery. And so you can have this variable period of, of discharge response as that's being recovered. But ultimately, um, as those ET rates uh, continue to increase, you may begin to see a deficit in terms of the hydrologic budget at some sites um, overall. And so to, to demonstrate that, this is a figure, um, this is taken from a hydrological model of Mica Creek watershed in Idaho. Um, so I want you to look specifically at the red dashed line. So that is the, uh, the modeled response um, to annual flow clear cutting of 100% of the watershed. And so what that demonstrates is that yes, you see that expected increase in annual flow um, during stage one. And so they've defined that stage one is, is that regeneration period. If you look at the red circles, those indicate the green up and how that's changing over time. So you can ev evaluate sort of what the hydrologic response looks like in relation to the green up period. Um, so during stage two, as you have that regrowth, that's where you have that hydrologic recovery or return to baseline conditions in terms of, uh, of that overall response. Um, they then see the undershoot response. So this is where um, there starts to become a deficit in terms of annual flow. Um, and then uh, in their model, their, their model underwent a canopy self-thinning, uh, which allowed that hydrologic response to return to those baseline conditions. Um, so those are annual flow responses, but of course, uh, understanding those hydrologic extremes are also very important. Um, so if we look specifically at peak flow responses, um, the peak flow response does follow the same trend as annual responses, which are that reducing cover does increase peak flow. Um, and this particular review is specific to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and again, this is the immediate response to that removal of, of vegetation. Um, in terms of the low flow response, um, also the same directionality in terms of a response immediately after harvest um, in the original LC watershed study, um, they did find a reduced number of low flow days that occurred immediately post logging. Um, and then also more recently, following the recent contemporary um, paired watershed study at Hinkle Creek, um, Surfleet and Skog Skogsit uh, have observed in mean August flow uh, an increase following those two harvest periods. So those little arrows are representing two separate uh, harvest events that occurred. And you can see that the year immediately following those events, there was an increase in um, those low flow metrics. Um, one exception to this, this is uh, Bull Run watershed, um, where Har in 1980 found that there was actually decreased low flow immediately after harvest. And um, they were able to attribute that to uh, fog drip, which is a very important component of the hydrologic budget uh, in that particular watershed. Um, so we talked about the long-term response at, at an annual scale, but also we can look at that at a low flow scale. 
So this is a, a figure from Perry and Jones 2016, where they evaluated streamflow response at H.J. Andrews and Coyote Creek, both of which are in Oregon in the Cascades. Um, and so they, they saw the same general trends where there's an increase in flow immediately post-harvest. There's some variable recovery period with, with a return to baseline, but then after 20 years, um, they start to see these deficits uh, across um, the, the sites that were evaluated. Um, so how are those summer low flow deficits uh, related to forest harvest? Um, when this was originally observed at the H.J. Andrews, um, the top panel here is Watershed 1, and you're seeing those deficits uh, that occur following harvest. Um, they hypothesized that this was due to establishment of alder uh, in the riparian zone at Watershed 1, which, was, which did not occur at Watershed 3. Um, of course, Watersheds 1 and 3, Watershed 1 was 100% clear cut, Watershed 3 was 25% patch cut. Um, and it, so the hypothesis is that it's conversion from primarily um, coniferous old growth to a deciduous tree species. The more recent hypothesis is that it's attributed primarily to um, stand age. And so the increased uh, transpiration rates of young relative to old growth uh, Douglas fir um, are, are also a leading hypothesis. So this figure is a figure from Moore, Moore's 20, 2004 paper where they did uh, SEP flux measurements to look at transpiration rates. You can see that the transpiration rate of the 40-year uh, trees is much greater than an old growth um, tree. And then if we look uh, at some additional um, information from that paper that now we're moving where the y-axis represents sap flux density as opposed to transpiration rate um, and so that top panel is essentially the same figure as what we just looked at if you move into the, the middle figure um, here we see uh, young Douglas fir sap flux density and then above that is the uh, red alder young stand um, sap flux density and so they did find um, that sap flux density was greater in red alder than Douglas fir and that it um, became statistically different beginning in late July and continuing through the growing season um, as you can see the, um, in, there in panel B. Um, so certainly transpiration rates do vary by age but also by species. Um, there are also age differences in, in the seasonal drought response, and so this is, um, this is a response that's been widely observed through a variety of eddy covariance measurements um, throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, so, so three studies cited here did find evapotranspiration declines in early seral conifer stands relative to old growth. This uh, top figure on the top right uh, shows that separation as you move into the growing season into summer of how old growth responds relative to young. Um, and this, these are eddy covariance measurements, so these are sort of actual evapotranspiration, so it's not just transpiration, this is the entire ecosystem's response. Um, so that incorporates the old growth stands are not just a single species. There are, I believe, eight species of conifer and three species of deciduous trees represented here as well as any understory of vegetation that may be present at either site. Um, so it's hypothesized that this response of early seral trees is due to the inability to uh, induce stomatal closure uh, for water conservation during that drought season. Um, but also a limited root system um, that may preclude um, any access to deeper water sources. And then finally, also uh, extreme microclimate conditions that may be faced uh, by some of those uh, younger early seral stands. Um, so now I want to move into talking a little bit about forestry best management practices. Um, we use the term best management practices because they aren't regulatory everywhere. Certainly in the Pacific Northwest, many of these are regulatory. Um, and um, these are just uh, an example of many of the more commonly applied best management practices. But of course, there are many um, that likely contribute to, um, to reducing the hydrological impact based off of some of what those earlier studies have shown. And so many of those paired watershed studies are based on historical harvesting practices and may not reflect uh, contemporary management, particularly when we think about the long-term response over time. Um, and so in terms of riparian buffers and leaf tree requirements, um, 
those are some of the most widely implemented best management practices across the US and across the globe. And those have very important implications in terms of the, the runoff component as well as the evapotranspiration component. Um, riparian buffers uh, are particularly interesting as we think about right now, maybe they're 60 or 70 years old, uh, but as those are, are left and uh, left untouched, then those will eventually become old growth stands that may have very different microclimatic uh, conditions that are important for watershed functions. Um, other best management practices like stream crossings, forest roads, skid trails, and landings, as well as erosion control, all of these are important for water routing. And so that's particularly important when we talk about peak flows or, or storm event mitigation. Um, so that affects runoff. Um, anything that reduces uh, the soil compaction uh, is, is beneficial in terms of thinking about uh, soil infiltration and ultimately runoff. Um, and then there's a variety of other things, including uh, fertilizers and herbicides, um, harvesting and reforestation, site prep, uh, and limiting sizes of harvest units or green up requirements um, that ultimately will have important implications in terms of evapotranspiration rates. And so that's thinking about this ecosystem as a whole of overstory and understory um, responses, species composition, density, and overall hydrologic recovery over the course of the entire rotation. Um, so it's difficult to tease apart the effects of any one of those uh, best management practices. Um, one effort, um, modeling effort from the folks at Micah Creek uh, did use their model to look at the effects of 100% clear cut on the watershed and then related to green up requirements where they're harvesting only 50% of the watershed. And so they're taking that placement of 50% harvest and placing it in different locations within the watershed to try to determine what those effects look like. Um, so, the, so on the left, you can see the two 100% clear, clear cut responses, and then on the right are those selective clear cut responses. Um, they found that when they varied the aspect of the positioning of that clear cut, there was no difference. So it didn't matter whether it was a north aspect or south aspect in their model. Um, and, but they did find that when they placed the clear cut higher um, upstream in the watershed, um, that there was greater flow than when they placed it further downstream in the watershed. And they, they have enough data to be able to uh, determine that that's primarily related to snowpack dynamics and elevational changes within their watershed. So moving into snowpack dynamics, so this ties back into what we observed earlier for the post-fire response in terms of snowpack. Um, a review of 65 sites, including 32 studies across the globe, um, has shown that as you change uh, forest cover, as forest cover increases, you have less snow accumulation uh, that occurs. Um, and, so, and so with a clear cut, uh, this bottom panel on, uh, shows clear cut size and as clear cut size increases, peak snow water equivalent increases as well. So it's basically another way to say greater uh, snow accumulation in a clear cut area. Um, but as we observed with, uh, with the fire example, um, also that there are increases in um, snow ablation or snow melt rates. <clears throat> and so a consequence of that is that it can actually result, result in earlier melt despite having more snow available. Uh, at Micah Creek, again, um, this is, they have a snow tell site there and they evaluated um, different uh, snow water equivalent under a clear cut, under a partial cut, and under full forest. Here, as expected, they did observe more snow uh, in the clear cut scenario, but they also found that it took longer to melt in the clear cut than in the uh, fully forested area. So it took 53 days in the clear cut re related to 36 days in the forested area. Um, so this is a little bit contradictory to what the uh, overall review says. Um, but overall, this and other studies all agree that, that um, there, are very, there are a lot of site-specific microclimatic factors that are important in determining those snowmelt rates, which ultimately are important if we think about any mitigation of, of strategies um, to increase snow, for example, in the watersheds. Um, so in terms of adaptation strategies for forest hydrology in general, um, if you want to reduce flow routing, so this is particularly important for storm events, um, obviously fewer forest roads, um, reducing soil compaction, those are important uh, strategies. Um, 
But in terms of, of thinking about the water budget as a whole, um, considering ecosystem scale evapotranspiration is important. Um, and so that, uh, that includes thinking about it throughout the entire harvest rotation and also thinking about some of those specific seasonal dynamics. Um, so ultimately, those strategies need to consider tree species, age, and climate. Um, and there's a lot of good, good ideas here today already about what some of those strategies may look like. Um, there is a question of whether or not reducing stand density will actually increase water availability. And I think using, um, for, so the, the example of the, my, the mountain pine beetle, for, for example, so sometimes reducing transpiration of an overstory species may not actually reduce evapotranspiration at the ecosystem level. And I think this is still a question um, where we need more research. And so if, um, even if transpiration is reduced in the, over, in the predominant species, um, it's, it, uh, there's a question of how long um, that it will take for the ecosystem to recover, uh, either through understory vegetation uh, transpiration processes or also evaporation processes within that system. Um, and then finally, as I just mentioned, in terms of increasing snow accumulation or um, reducing snow melt rates, um, potential strategies, of course, could be utilizing those canopy gaps to increase snow accumulation, but also to um, strategize how those mixed species stands or variable canopy structure may also limit some of those um, energy factors that, that affect snow melt rates um, overall. And so I think I'm over time, so I will take questions.